Hey guys, it's Mrs. Malott. We are on chapter eight, lesson two, or day two. You have seven to eight objectives today. Remember, we didn't get to the one from yesterday. That's what makes it eight. Um, and that was talking about the effects of aging on the skin. But today we're gonna talk about the, what's inside the dermis and how the skin plays a role in developing your fingerprints. You need to be able to compare and contrast sudoriferous and sebaceous glands as well as apocrine and ecrine glands. You need to know what sebum is and where you find it. You need to know how blackheads are formed and be able to describe the process that's involved in that, as well as know what the structures are in the subcutaneous fascia. And last but not least, know how the skin heals if there is a wound. So there's quite a lot we need to get covered here today. I'm pulling up the PowerPoint here. So hopefully um, you remember from yesterday the three different layers of the skin and at the top one is the epidermis. That's where you find the melanocytes that are the cells that produce the pigment melanin. Um, we talked about different pigments. We talked about carotene and we talked about bilirubin, how they both make you yellow. We talked about how when the adrenal glands are not functioning that you can develop a bronze-like color. Um, and we talked about the functions of the integumentary system as a whole being temperature regulation and protection from infection um, and keeping our skin from drying out and uh, things like that. Um, so you need to kind of keep those fresh in your mind as well. Um, we're going to get started here as soon as my phone pulls up the PowerPoint so I can look off of that and know where to start. While I'm waiting on that, don't forget you have chapter eight key terms and workbook questions that you need to be working on, um, as well as any OSHA um, assignments that uh, you need to get caught up on. All right, so we talked yesterday all about the epidermis. So now we're going to talk about the second layer, the middle layer of the skin, the dermis. Um, it's the thicker layer of the skin. Um, inside this layer is where you're going to find capillaries, fibers that are made of collagen and make your skin a little elastic. Um, you're going to find muscles. Again, here's another way that muscles play a role in another system. Uh, you're going to have nerve endings lymphatic vessels, hair follicles, sweat glands, which we call sudoriferous glands, sebaceous glands, which are oil glands in your skin. So um, when we talked about the epidermis, we said there's no blood vessels, no nerves, or anything, but here you're going to find that and more. At the top layer of the skin, there's these little projections that go up into the epidermis. Um, and that is where your fingerprints come from. They're called dermal papillae, um, and they project up into the epidermis, and they create fingerprints. They do this on your toes as well, and you get toe prints. Remember that no two people have the same fingerprints and toe print patterns. These um, areas also have nerve fibers in them that allow you to sense what's going on in your environment, you know, allow for touch and things like that. In this middle layer of skin is where the blood vessels are, are found. We said we don't have any in the top layer, but this is where you will find blood vessels. So when the uh, blood comes rushing into them, if they're, it's in your face, you may get like uh, what we call blushing and it has to do with the blood rushing in and things like that also in this area you have these collagen and elastic fibers that allow that flexibility that your skin can move it's not hard and it has to stay in one place it has the ability to move with you and um kind of conform to the spaces around you so when you put your arm down on the um, table, for instance, it doesn't stay the same, kind of flattened so, the, so that your um, arm can be comfortable and things like that. But one thing that does happen as you get older is you start to lose that elasticity, which is why as you get older, you develop wrinkles. It doesn't have that ability to bounce back like you used to. So, you know, when you're 90 years old, it, the skin doesn't just go back to normal as quickly. So that's how you get wrinkles. 
Um, now we're going to talk about the difference between the different kinds of glands. The first kind of glands we want to talk about are sweat glands. So sudoriferous is the name that we use to refer to sweat glands, but there's actually two different types of sweat glands. You have the apocrine sweat glands with an A, and you are going to find these in the areas of the groin, um, armpits and places like that um believe it or not they're considered to be a sexual attractant that's what they say i know you guys probably don't think of it that way but the actual substance that they produce sweat itself does not smell it does not have an odor um the skin in that area and the bacteria and so forth that is in that area where the sweat is released is what gives us that body odor that we're familiar with when we talk about sweat glands. And these apocrine sweat glands are typically the ones that you think about when you think about sweat. The other kind of sweat glands are the ecrine glands. This is the ones on the palms of your feet, um, palms of your hands, I'm sorry, the bottom of your feet, on your forehead, your upper lip. And these serve the purpose of sweating for the purpose of temperature regulation. Um, they aren't, um, the apocrine aren't involved in that temperature regulation. It's the ecrine ones. You have millions of sweat glands in your body. Um, on average, people sweat about a half a liter or 500 milliliters each day. Um, and we talked about, you know, how sweat itself does not have an odor. It comes from the bacteria and things like that that are in the area giving us that body odor smell. And that's also why one person's sweat doesn't necessarily smell like another person's sweat. Now, we said sudoriferous were the sweat glands, and even though sweat itself doesn't have odor, the way that I tell the two apart is sudor kind of has the word odor in it, and you kind of think of it along that lines, if that helps you out. The sebaceous glands are all about the oil, and they are secreting oil, and that oil is called sebum. Um, when it is secreted, it helps prevent your skin from drying out, and it also helps um, prevent pathogens from coming on and um, infecting you and getting skin infections and that sort of thing. So on the next slide, you can see that image that you're going to have to label for your test with all the different parts labeled. And you can see that middle layer there is basically um, from kind of like the purple on top layer down to like the blood vessels all of that whole layer is there is the dermis um, and so there's where you find the different glands and you find the hair follicles and you find the blood vessels and things like that as well but under that is where you're going to find the lower layer of the skin, that subcutaneous fascia. And as we mentioned yesterday, we sometimes call that the hypodermis. Um, in this layer of the skin is where you're going to find even more elastic, connective, and fatty tissue cells. The fat cells or lipocytes produce fat that we need to prevent or to provide padding in order to protect our body from under things underneath the skin. Remember we said the integumentary system did play a large role in the in the protection of, of surfaces under um, our, our skin. And the bottom part of that then attaches directly to the muscles, specifically skeletal muscles of our body. <clears throat> so, um, when we have a damage to our skin, a cut, something like that, um, it, we, it's considered to be a damage to the skin. Uh, the skin can get punctured or damaged in some kind of wound or that kind of thing. Um, and what happens is the blood rushes to the site and fills the wound up with blood. Um, and inside our blood, we have clotting factors 
that will allow the clot process to start. And the top part of the blood is, gets exposed to the air and creates a clot. And it forms kind of what they say is nature's band-aid or a scab. Um, that's why you shouldn't um, pick at your scabs. It's actually there to prevent bacteria from getting down into the wound itself and prevent um, things from entering our body that we do not want in our body. And so after that first initial step, inflammation starts to occur. And so white blood cells then come into the area and start um, cleaning up the area, if you will, um, cleaning up the damaged areas and that kind of thing. Then you have fibroblasts come in that start pulling the edges of this cut together to try to repair it. And cells then begin to produce new cells from the bottom up to replace where that blood is and so forth. Now, hopefully when we have a damage to our skin, it's not severe. But if it's deep enough or wide enough, um, we can develop a scar, which occurs when that area gets filled in with collagen instead of repaired cells. Now, scars themselves don't have any blood vessels or any feeling or anything like that in it. They don't move the same way that the skin does or anything. So you have to, um, that's why we want to try to prevent scars from happening. Um, some of the ways that we do that is through the use of stitches, adhesive strips, or that new kind of glue that we use when somebody has an injury or hurts themselves in order to try to help our body pull those edges of the skin together. Um, we're in ideal situations, the wounds are healed from the inside out so they start kind of at the bottom on the inside and work their way out um, the inside should heal before the outside and if not you can get actually a pocket of infection in there and then you have some complications that can occur um, and so the last few pictures there for today the first one shows you like that process of healing and how that occurs and so forth you can see then um, on the next slides some examples of keloids. The first, the, the middle slide of a picture there on figure 8-8 eight, eight, shows you what is called a keloid. This is an excessive scarring kind of situation. Some people um, overgrow tissue as a result of the damage and they're called keloids and you can see the result there. Um, sometimes keloids start out looking that bright pink that you see there, but if you go to the next slide, you can see over time they sometimes, not always, sometimes um, gradually go from that bright pink color into the more skin toned color um, over time, but that's not necessarily every time. So that is it for today. If you have any questions, shoot me an email. I'll try to get back to you. If not, I will see you tomorrow, guys.